Today we're in Revelation chapter 1. We're continuing a series we just began in the book of Revelation. We'll be looking at verses 9 through 20. And so I'll begin reading here in Revelation chapter 1 at verse 9. And uh, let's see, I didn't, didn't note to myself how far I'd take it beginning. I'll just read verse 20, verses 9 through 20. John chapter 1, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book, send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to Laodicea, and to Chino. Then, just seeing if you're listening, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. His voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen. And the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So last time we were together, let me lay a foundation for you before we enter into this portion by reminding you of the fact that last time we were together, John reminded us that Jesus Christ is returning. Remember verse 7, how he had said, Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. He had said, I am coming with the clouds. Now, I, I mentioned to you that when Jesus says, Behold, when he hears the word, the word rather, Behold, uh, that's a word that is, is used uh, a number of times. I, I mentioned to you that behold is a word intended to draw our complete attention to something. It's a word that encourages us to consider closely what is being said. And it's a word that is mentioned often in Scripture. You might find this interesting. Just that word behold is used around 581 times in the New King James Version, 25 times in the book of Revelation alone. One of my favorite verses using that word is found in 2 Corinthians. I mentioned this in the last time we were together in 2 Corinthians uh, 5.17, where, where Paul had said, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation, old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so, behold is intended to draw your attention. And with that said, John wrote, behold, he is coming with the clouds. In other words, this is something that is certain. And that would mean you need to be prepared. You need to be prepared now, not next week, not next month, not next year, but you need to be prepared now. That's the point he's making. He's coming soon. You see, the knowledge that Christ is returning is intended to, intended to cause us to be inspired uh, concerning the way that we're living. We're to live in anticipation of seeing him. We're to live in anticipation of being with him. This word is intended to encourage us to be ready because he's coming soon. In 1 John 3, 2 and 3, John said it like this. He said, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, 
for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You see, his, his return is to cause us to be anticipating and ready to live a life that is holy. And it's also intended to give us hope. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, it says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Be prepared and be encouraged. So when John writes, Behold, he's coming, he's not speaking only of his return. He's also speaking of the one who is returning. He's speaking of Messiah. When you read your Bible, you'll see various words that are used to speak of Jesus who is Messiah. You'll see that he had different titles. He's called the prophet. He's called the branch. He's called the Christ. He's called the bridegroom. He's the son of man. But he is also called the coming one. The word coming speaking of the expected one. We see that in the Gospel of Matthew. The Messiah was also referred to as the coming one. Because in Matthew, John the Baptist was in prison and he sent disciples to question Jesus. It's found in Matthew eleven two through 3. And it says, when John heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? The coming one was another title for Messiah. So when they asked, are you the coming one? Are you Messiah? So John uses this picture when he's speaking of Jesus coming with the clouds. This is a reference to the Messiah, to Jesus and his return. This is something as mentioned earlier his return is referred to throughout the Old as well as the New Testament. It's spoken of often, but there are those who reject that he'll ever do such a thing. There are those who say he's never going to come back. He's been saying that for a long time. He hasn't come yet. That's a sign that we're in the last days. In 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4, it says, Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. That's happening right now. I mentioned to you that approximately one out of every 25 New Testament verses promised the return of Christ. Jesus repeatedly spoke of his return. He encouraged followers to be ready. In Matthew 16, 27, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, then he'll reward each according to his works. In Matthew 26, verse 64, Jesus said, It is as you said, Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven. And so he was speaking concerning that. He is coming with clouds. Every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. They will mourn these tribes of the earth, because it's too late. Because he's returned, and it's too late for them to be right with God. Don't wait. Don't wait until the last minute, because you never know when that last minute is. You never know when your last opportunity to receive Christ is. And that's what's going on as we enter into verse 9. You see, God has assured us of the return of his Son, and we had seen in verse 8 that he's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the all-knowing one, and that makes this promise solid. And seeing that he inhabits eternity, he knows that this promise is certain. And as he's made that promise, John writes in verse 9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this records his vision, the vision of Jesus, and it also records his commission to write to seven churches. And these churches are enduring tribulation and persecution. And again, tribulation and persecution, guys, never forget this, is something that we believers have been prepared to expect. Sometimes I think in, in our day we've forgotten that. We think that somehow we're supposed to always have sunny days and no affliction or problems. But in John 16, verse 33, Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you'll have tribulation, but take heart, 
I have overcome the world. So he speaks of himself here. Notice how he speaks of himself as a brother and companion in tribulation. And he's on a place in an island called Patmos. If you were looking at a map, it's in the Aegean Sea. It's, it's off the Turkish coast, about 30 or 40 miles. He's on, if this is happening, he says, on the Lord's Day. What day is that? That's Sunday, which was a customary way of speaking of Sunday. He's been arrested. He's been exiled. Notice because of the word of God and for his testimony. Now, when it says that, he's on the island called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. By the end of the first century, Christianity had already become a hated religion in Rome. The faith of Christians was regarded as superstition. It was, it was something that was held fast to by the uneducated masses. Does that sound familiar? Because that's being said today. That only the um, people who cling to Bibles and their guns. That's being said today, guys. Some of you haven't noticed that. But there is an antagonism to Jesus Christ and Christianity that is it, the mask is being taken off even as I'm reading this to you. Well, it was already a hated religion in Rome. Christians were already regarded as superstitious people. They were uneducated. That's because the majority of those who were coming to faith in Christ were of the common people. Many slaves and, and, and many people who were called common were coming to faith. Paul mentioned that in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, when he said, you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. There are not many noble, not many mighty, not many people who are philosophers and all who are followers of Christ. It was true then, it's true today. When you read your history, the Roman governor Pliny said Christianity is a depraved and extravagant superstition. The Roman historian Tacitus said Christians are a class hated for their abomination. Rome was opposed to Christianity. Romans considered believers disloyal because we would not acknowledge Caesar, the government, as all-powerful. Christians would not burn incense before his image and declare him to be a god, and thus they were persecuted. Christians met at night, and because they met at night, they were accused of plotting to overthrow government. Christians were considered atheists because they rejected Rome's many gods. Christians were falsely accused of cannibalism because they had communion services remembering Christ. They were accused of incest because they called each other brother and sister and therefore brothers were marrying sisters, so they're incestuous. They were, ups they, they were persecuted for the disruption of business because they interfered with the sales of idols. They were anti-family because they were loyal first to Jesus Christ. They were accused of causing natural disasters because Christians would not worship their idols. And when bad things happened, the Christians were blamed. And because believers did not attend festivals and other pagan events, they were antisocial. Does any of that sound familiar? Because that's what took place in the early church. You see, by the time of John, persecution against Christians had become common. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, we'll see Antipas a faithful pastor, had been martyred. John had been imprisoned. Under the emperor Domitian, governmental persecution formally began, and John was a victim of this persecution. Paul had said in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And that's what takes place to those who love the Lord and those who truly believe in him. If you don't think so, post something about Christ on your Facebook page and then wait for the trolls to come out. It's true. In verse 9, John says, I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation, he said, and in the kingdom. I, John, this is the third time he refers to himself by name, but he identifies himself as, as a brother and a companion 
in tribulation. He's saying, I'm suffering alongside of you. But the suffering is for the word of God and it's for the testimony of Jesus. Suffering isn't something that should come as a, as a surprise, is what he's saying. Now, in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, the apostle had said, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through, as if something strange is happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you'll have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world, instead of kicking against the prods and and wondering why I'm going through this, he says, realize it's preparing you as you see the Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks of the patience of Jesus. He's holding fast, and he's enduring, and he's not giving up. This is not patience for Jesus, by the way. This is not the patience of Jesus. It's the kind of patience that draws its life and endurance from Jesus. This is patience that Jesus gives me strength to have. And again in verse 9, he's on the island for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's exiled because of his uncompromising stand for the gospel. Now this persecution had a very early origin in the mission of the church. In the book of Acts chapter 3, verse, chapter three and chapter 4, uh, Peter and John were jailed for the healing of a crippled man at the beautiful gate. In Acts chapter 8, Stephen was martyred for preaching that Jesus is Messiah. In Acts chapter 12, King Herod martyred James and imprisoned the apostle Peter. So very early in the history of the church, the apostles were persecuted. You see them being jailed in uh, Acts chapter 5. They had been ordered to cease teaching in the name of Jesus. They, they had been told, you can't proclaim the name of Christ. And, and Peter gave a classic response. In Acts 5.29, Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's why we're here right now, by the way. Because we ought to obey God rather than men. That's what we do. And today, amen. <laughs> Pastors need to continue preaching and teaching even when threatened with jail. We ought to. Why? Because we've been commanded to preach the gospel. We've been commanded. And we should expect, though we Americans have been very spoiled and blessed by God, but we should expect the things that are taking place right now. I see some pastors who are willing for their people to go to jail, but I'm not sure that they're willing to go themselves. But we need to be ready and we need to be prepared because we've been called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what happened to him. He was jailed or exiled actually on the isle called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Not because he was breaking some law that God had given to us, but because he had been effective in his proclamation of the gospel and Rome was upset with him. And that's what he's speaking about. And notice what he says in verse 10 when he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. So when he says, I was in the spirit, that's another way of saying I'm under the spirits, the Holy Spirit's influence. And this was on what he called the Lord's day, which is for those who take notes, this is a minor thing you may think, but it's really important. There's many who argue we're supposed to be meeting on Shabbat or Sabbath. But the Lord's Day speaks of Sunday, the first day of the week. Chrysostom was an archbishop to Constantinople in the fourth century. And he said, it is called the Lord's Day because this is the day that the Lord rose from the dead and was devoted to him. So the church would meet on the first day of the week. I remember a lady approaching me after a church service many years ago now and how she had said to me, she said, you know, the Lord is blessing this fellowship. And I said, amen, amen, he is. And she said, but he has a word for you that I'm to give to you. And I said, is that right? Well, speak on, say on. And she, said, and she kind of cleared her throat a bit. And she said, thus saith the Lord, I am blessing you now, but if you met on Saturday, I would bless you more. And I said, God didn't say that, you did. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. You know, and the church from the earliest would meet on the first day of the week. This is what's taking place here, where he's on the, in the spirit on the Lord's day, the first day of the week, the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And as this is taking place, verse 10, he says, I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. It's not the actual trumpet. I want you to notice that. It says, as of a trumpet. That's a picture. That's a picture of an announcement, announcement of royalty. And this is occurring uh, during a time of prayer and worship. And here's what the voice is speaking. Verse 11, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book. Send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Notice how he says what you see right in a book, not just some loose notes. I want you to write this in a book. I want it to be preserved. This is another way of him saying, this is scripture that I'm giving to you, therefore preserve it. And he says in verse 11, send it to the seven churches in Asia. Now, when it speaks of Asia, this is not the Far East as we know it. This is what has been called the Roman provinces of Asia Minor. And it speaks concerning seven churches. For those who take notes, number seven is the number of completeness or perfection. These seven churches are to represent all churches. And each one of the churches, as, as we'll see in chapters two and three, have a particular significance. So he said, write this and send it to these seven churches. And I have had the opportunity of visiting the seven churches on two different occasions. The first time I was able to, to, to visit the seven churches was with my pastor, Chuck Smith, uh, about 30 years ago or so. And he took us and gave us Bible studies in each one of these churches. It's a memory that I'll, I'll never forget. It was a great time. And I've shared this with you recently, but I'll say it briefly. It was one of the most enjoyable times I've ever had, but it was raining. It was raining every day. And anybody here who's ever been in a bus for six or seven hours when it's raining, well, it's not a really comfortable thing. As a matter of fact, it gets a little boring because you're just kind of in the rain and you can't see anything. You get off very briefly and get back on because we're driving from point A to point B, visiting each one of these churches. And it was taking a, a long time. And so what happened is uh, I and I was with Raul, Raul Reese and, and Ron Wilkins and Randy Walls and several of us. There were about nine or ten pastors in the very back of this huge bus. We were in the very back. And it was a big old bus. It was so big it even had a bathroom in, in the bus. That's how big it was. And and Chuck was up there in the very front and 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 the tour guy was sharing about different things about Turkey because that's where all of this takes place. And, and we got kind of bored and we started laughing with one another. And before you know it, we were making a commotion. Didn't realize it, but we were laughing so much. And, and it was very fun. And then, so we got on the bus again on the next day, on Tuesday. And we started up very early, just laughing and laughing and laughing because we, we, we were bored. Now it's the third day, and Karen Johnson, Jeff Johnson from Calvary Downey, Karen Johnson came and said, Chuck wants you up in the front. And she did it like the angry mother, you know, the scolding kind of thing. Chuck wants you up in the front. And we go, oh, man, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Dad wants us in the front. And so we all had to go up in the front of the bus. And so there's Chuck right here, right? He was one row in front of me. Rawl was right next to me. And then a couple of the other guys were all around there. We all had to sit there. And everybody was quiet. Nobody was saying anything. And Rawl opened up his Bible. And when Rawl Reese opened up his Bible, I looked at him. And Chuck was right here. And I looked at Rawl and he said, that's the first time, Rawl, that's the first time you've opened your Bible all week. You don't read that and you know it. You're just trying to make Chuck impressed with your spirituality. Chuck starts laughing. And before you know it, we're laughing with Chuck for three days, telling stories, laughing, crying with one another. We had a great time. And so Kay, his wife, talks to us later on, talked to us and said, you thought Chuck was mad at you. He wasn't mad. He wanted to laugh with you. And he could hear you laughing in the back, and it bothered him. He wasn't part of it. And that's how that worked, you know. So I, that's one of my fond memories of my time with my pastor. All the time I thought that he was mad at us when, in fact, he wanted to laugh with us, which he did. And she said that is the best trip they'd ever taken before. 
But we've been there. These seven churches, I've seen them. I've walked on the grounds where the churches used to be in the different cities. These, if you looked at a map, these seven churches are in a, about between 30 and 50 miles apart in a circular route. And uh, they were postal districts. They were the central points for disseminating information, and that's why he's speaking to the seven churches. And so he sees these seven. Now notice, he says, I turned, verse 12, to see the voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Seven golden lampstands. These are seven lampstands that are forming a circle. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. Again, seven representing completeness. That would speak of the churches throughout the world. And God is speaking concerning, and I want you to see this there, seven lampstands of gold. Golden lampstands. Gold reveals the value that God places on the church. In other words, though our government may not consider us essential, God does. And he says these are seven golden lampstands because they have a value the church is the most valuable community on earth because this church has been paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ. And these represent the kinds of churches that exist throughout church history. We'll see that in chapters 2 and 3. And we're going to look at each one of those individually. Now, it speaks of the lampstand. The lampstand is the menorah. It's a symbol of Israel, the light of the world in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 42, verse 6, it says, I, the Lord, have have called you in righteousness and, and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. The menorah was a light that was to represent God. It was re representing God and it represents Israel, who is the light. So somebody wrote, the sages emphasize that light is not a violent force. Israel is to accomplish its mission by setting an example and not by using force. So this symbol spiritually represents the church as Jesus taught us in Matthew 5.14 when he said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. That's what Paul made clear in Philippians 2 when he wrote in verse 15 that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Or 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5, when he said, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. And so he begins to speak concerning that. Now notice verse 13. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. In the midst of the seven lampstands, in the midst of the church. He's not walking about it at this moment. He's standing still. It emphasizes his constant action in the midst of his church. And he is the son of man. The term son of man is what is called a messianic title. It's first used in Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. The son of man is used twice here. And then later on in uh, chapter 14 verse 14. The son of man, a title of Messiah, emphasizes his humanity as well as him being Messiah. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce this as in a moment. I'm going to share some things that we find in these, these verses of description. But let, let's begin by asking a question. When you think of Jesus, in your mind, when I say Jesus, and you have in your mind, uh, not an I, I, idolatrous image, but when you have a thought about Christ, what is it about him that you think he might have looked like? Not necessarily facially, but what, what do you think he may have looked like? See, when I, when I think of Jesus very often, I, I think of him as he looked on the cross. I, I, in, in my heart, I, I see a, a broken and, and bloody man. That's, that's, that's what I think of. Isaiah 52, 14, just as many were astonished at you, so his visage 
was marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men. I think, I think of Isaiah 53, verse 2. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a, a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So very often when I, I, I meditate on the Lord, I, I remember his death for me and, and the fact that he, was, he suffered in such a way. So I, I can think of him that way, but many think of him as, uh, as he was as he ministered uh, amongst the people, a soft, gentle kind of man. Sometimes they may even think of him in the uh, pictures you get in parables and stories uh, that he's like carrying a lamb in his arms. We think of him as, as, as meek and we, we think of him as mild. Uh, like Isaiah 40 verse 11 says concerning Messiah, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. Gently lead those who are with young. For some may think of Christ. They may think of Christ as the one who died on a cross for us. For others, they may think of Jesus as that gentle, loving teacher that, that cared for people, held children in his in his hands, that, that, that John could rest his head upon his bosom. They, they may think of him in that way. And, and these, these thoughts of Christ, of course, are accurate. Je Jesus is gentle, and Jesus is kind, and, and Jesus is loving. And, and Jesus also laid his life down for us as the Lamb of God, and, and that's accurate also. But we, we can forget that, that he is also holy, and, and we can forget that he is also the righteous judge of the whole earth. We can forget that though he gently held children, he also drove money changers from the temple. Ezekiel 34, 16 says, I will seek what was lost, bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken, strengthen what was sick, but I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. And so we, we, we sometimes have only a partial picture of Messiah. And, and we can concentrate on on Jesus as he walked on earth, and we can fail to realize his real glory. And here John is giving to us a glimpse of the risen Christ. And as he does so, notice what he says in verse 13. He says, he was clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden girdle, with a belt. So the robe that he's wearing is describing him as the great high priest. It this robe represents his dignity, his judgment. It's like Aaron, the high priest robes, the first high priest of Israel. In Exodus 28, verse 2, it says, Make sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honor. And that's what you see with Christ. You see dignity and honor. It speaks of the golden girdle. The girdle is a belt. It's like the girdle of the high priest. This belt was worn by the high priest to remind him that he was a servant. So Jesus Christ, this great one, still came and gave us life for all. Notice verse 14, his, his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes like a flame. And this is the risen Christ. It's a picture of majesty, of glory, holiness. It's reminiscent of the transfiguration. Remember in Matthew 17, when Jesus is up on this hill and he's with some of his men, Matthew 17, verse 2 says he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as light. And so he's seeing something he didn't see on earth. Remember in John 17, verse 5, Jesus had prayed and he had said, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. In John 17, 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. And John is seeing something. He's seen Jesus' purity. He's seen his holiness. He's seen his eternality. It reveals that Jesus Christ is the judge. He's the judge of the whole earth. As it says in Psalm 9, verse 8, he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall administer judgment for the people in uprightness. It's like Daniel 7, verse 9. As I looked, thrones were set in place. The Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. When you think of Jesus, you need to remember that, that he was the Lamb of God, but he is also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And we fail to realize that sometimes. 
In verse 15, his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. Brass is, is a picture in Scripture that is a symbol of judgment. It's also bronze. In the Old Testament, the brazen or the brass altar was connected with sacrifice for sin. In Exodus 38, 30, they used it to make bases for the entrance to the tent of meeting, the bronze altar with its bronze grating and all its utensils. So it's a picture of judgment. That's reminiscent of what you read in Isaiah 63. Their Messiah is questioned as to why his garments are so red. In Isaiah 63, verses 3 through 6, he says, I've trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I have trodden them in my anger, trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury, it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth. That's not the picture of meek and mild Jesus, is it, that most of us are used to. His voice, according to verse 10, is the sound of many waters. It's a voice of depth, authority. It's a voice that's important for all to hear. That's what the trumpet represents, and that's what the waters represent. His voice is not going to calm a troubled sea. It will call down judgment on the wicked. In verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So, in his hand, he had seven stars. Again, seven stars speak of the messengers, the angels of the churches. You'll see that. It says it in verse 20. Notice he is holding on to them. That means that the pastors are under his security and his protection. What is it that gives you strength and gives you courage today? What gives me courage is the fact that I'm held by Jesus, that I'm in his hand. And he has said that he holds us in his hand and that no one can take us from his hand. So it gives us a sense of security and it gives me a sense of protection. The Lord is on my side. In verse 16, he says, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. When it speaks of a two-edged or, or double-edged sword, it, it's speaking of his word. Out of his mouth goes his word. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Ephesians 6.17 says, Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So God's word is going to be active when he brings divine judgment. What takes place is exactly what he said is going to take place, and there will be no excuses. You know, when, when the Lord brought um, judgment on the earth and closed the, the door, of that ark so that none could enter in. I think that people don't realize that when God brings his judgment, it's going to be sudden, it's going to be final. And this is a picture that Jesus, we're getting in, introduced to in the first chapter of Revelation, that, that Jesus is bringing judgment and, and it's, it's a sure thing. The word of God is sure and his judgment is sure. He has declared it. It says in Revelation 19 verse Verse 15, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. It says his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength, which speaks of his brilliant glory. Now, how do you think you would act if you were brushing your teeth and Jesus was behind you and you saw this? Well, what did he do? Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last. No longer is John just kind of palling around with Jesus. No longer is he placing his head on Jesus' bosom to listen to the heartbeat of God. No longer is he comfortable 
because glory has been revealed. And I want you to see this in verse 17, because this vision caused him great fear. Why? He saw the glory of Jesus Christ. And he has a fear. It's a holy fear. It's a fear that causes you to resist sin. It's like when Isaiah said, woe is me, I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You know, there have been times when I don't do this anymore. I don't watch these channels anymore. But there was a time when I would watch what was called Christian TV. And you would have some uh, evangelist normally, some some person who liked to stir up the emotions and passions of people with stories and things. And and I, I've heard these things and I've read these things where people have said, like, for example, somebody was speaking to a, a well-known pastor and, and he said to him, uh, every morning when I'm shaving, he says, Jesus appears to me and uh, we have a conversation. And he told this to this well-known pastor and he said to the well-known pastor, do you, uh, do you believe this? He says, every morning when I'm shaving, Jesus appears to me and we have a conversation. And he said, do you believe this? And the well-known pastor says, no, I don't. But what makes me afraid is I think you do, you know, because, because we have taken the holiness of God and we have cheapened it. We've taken the glory of God and we've cheapened it. You have to understand something and it'll help us here as we get into Revelation. John knew Jesus for a long time. He, Jesus was John's cousin. He knew him over a lifetime. John ministered alongside of Jesus on earth. He, he heard his teachings. He had, as mentioned a moment ago, he had laid his head on his bosom. He knew him. He was familiar with him. But now he sees him for who he really is. By the eye of faith, he had seen him. He knew Christ was Messiah. But now he's seen him. He's seen him, and it causes humility to come, which represents a deep faith. You see, he had seen Jesus when Jesus was, was on that cross. He had seen Jesus when he was taken off, and, and when Jesus was buried. He'd seen Jesus when Jesus was resurrected. He saw Jesus when Jesus ascended, he had seen all of these things, but he hadn't seen this. He had a familiarity with Christ over a lifetime. He had ministry experience for the three, three and a half years or so that he walked with him. He saw the ascension of Christ. He knew who he was. He was there at the, at the Mount Transfiguration. And for a moment when Christ was, was transfigured before him and the conversation was, was taking place and all that he was overhearing, he saw all of that. But now he sees him for who he is. Listen, when you get a glimpse of Jesus for who he is, humility occurs in your life. One of the things that you, this, this is so important and I can't say it properly. I know I can't. One of the things that you will see, you will know, and this can also, and I, I don't mind you applying this to me. When you're listening to someone talk about Jesus Christ, not only are their words to be accurate and true, they are to be accurate and true, but what is the attitude of the person giving you those words? Be careful about that, because arrogance and pride is not of the Lord, and the person who's been in the presence of God is going to have a different demeanor than the one who just likes to talk about him. Keep that in mind. Because sometimes you'll put on the TV and you'll see some guy parading up and down that platform telling you stories of glory. He's usually the hero, giving you stories of glory, what he's done, what he's seen, who he is. And if you don't walk out of that church service or you don't walk out, turn the TV on and walk out of that room saying, I know Jesus better, then you got to know something you don't need to know. The one you need to know Please understand me when I say this. I know it's not making sense to some. Is not that pastor or not that preacher. The one you need to get a glimpse of is Jesus Christ. That's who you need to see. 
understand that. That's why I have what's behind me. That's why. Look at the, the dove and look above the dove. We would see Jesus. Pastors come and go, but he lives forever. The one that you want is Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind. And you don't need hero heroism and you don't need heroic pastors. You already have a hero. And that's, my, that's our Lord and that's our Savior. And remember this. John knew him very well. Of course he did. But now he sees him. And now as he sees him, he gets a glimpse of that glory. And when he sees him, he sees himself. And when you see God, that's, the, that's by the way, that's the root of, of humility. Is You want to have humility? You see, when you see Jesus, you see yourself in comparison. That humbles you. And that's what happens. And so the Lord has to speak to him. And the Lord has to say, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the one who lives, verse 18, was dead. Behold, I live forevermore. Amen. I am the one who once was alive and is now alive, but I have always been alive. I'm alive, and I give life to all who trust in me. I have the keys to Hades and death. Hades is the invisible world. I have authority over it, and, and death has been defeated. I am sovereign over death, and I am sovereign over existence after death. I am the Lord, is what Jesus is saying, and the king of, over all things. I am the one who was alive. I'm the one who died, but I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of Hades and of death. I'm the one who stripped death of its power. I'm the one who died, was resurrected, and I give life to those who have relationship with me. And therefore, write, verse 19, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, the things which will take place after this. Write those things which have, you have seen, which are contained here in, in, in these verses. Um, write which, the things which are, which we're going to see in chapters 2 and 3, and, and write concerning the things to come, which we'll see in chapters 4 through 22. And then he finally says the mystery, verse 20, of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches, the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. He explains once again, what these are. Now, one last thought for you. When you read the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation contains references or allusions from um, around 28 out of the 39 Old Testament books. In other words, there are 28 of the 39 Old Testament books are referred to in the book of Revelation. There are over 505 citations some say as many as 635 that are contained in 404 verses of this book. Around 325 are from prophetic books of the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The minor prophets, references to Zechariah, Joel, Amos, and Hosea are most common. Uh, the books of the first five, uh, 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 the books of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, the greatest use uh, is made of Exodus, and the poetic uh, sections, uh, the, the greatest use is found in the book of Psalms. And, and the reason I'm saying that to you is if you want to understand Revelation, somebody said this and I liked what they said, then, then you need to know the Old Testament. You need to read your Old Testament. Because you can read the newspaper and you'll see that things today are unfolding just as Scripture says. But the better way to understand is to compare Scripture with Scripture. What did God say in the Old Testament? Because in the New Testament, you're seeing the things God said in the Old would be fulfilled. You're seeing it now revealed in the book of Revelation and other books of the New Testament. I like to look at the, at, at the news. Uh, sometimes I fast from it. It's so negative. And, you know, sometimes my wife and I just won't watch it for a day or two because it feels like everything's going to hell in a handbasket every day, right? So I'll tell Marie, if I want bad news, I'll read one of my books. No. Uh, where's the good news come from? It comes from Scripture. Because if you only see what appears to be taking place right now, then you would think that we end up losing 
But if you read through the book, read the last chapter, read the last couple of verses, we win. Because in Jesus Christ, we're more than conquerors. We're on the winning side. During World War II, the, um, the Japanese had a, um, a woman by the name of Tokyo Rose. Some of you have heard of this, who was a propagandist who would come on and she would speak to the GIs and she'd say, Japan has taken this island, Japan has taken this place here. And she would say, you need to give up, Joe. You need to give up because you're losing. It was total propaganda. The things she was saying were not true. But it began to, to dispirit the, the GIs. And so when you heard Tokyo Rose saying the things that she was saying, it caused the men to lose hope. Listen, don't listen to the voice of, of the enemy. Don't listen to the voice of the enemy. I, 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 I don't want to hear his voice. I want to hear the voice of the Spirit. And John, John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and Jesus spoke to him. I, I want to be in his word because through his word, he speaks to me. Through his word, he, he, he communicates. When I pray, I speak to him, but when I read his word, he speaks to me. And as I read his word, he gives me hope. If I read the newspaper or watch the news, that gives me despair. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I have no doubt in my mind that the church is triumphant, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And I know that Jesus Christ is the conqueror and the victor. And so I keep my mind on him because in Christ, I am more than a conqueror. In Christ, I am a, a victor. Why? Because he has won and I am on his side. And so as you read this, keep that in mind. When John saw Jesus, he fell at his feet as one who is dead. This is a man who knew Christ from the time he was a, he was a little boy. He walked with Christ. He, before Jesus announced himself as Messiah, he knew who Jesus was. His mother was Jesus' sister. He grew up with him. But when Jesus revealed himself as Messiah, for those three years or so, he walked with him. He heard things that had never been said before. He saw things that had never been done before. He saw Jesus walk on water. He saw Jesus raise the dead. He saw Jesus cast out demons. He heard the words that were marvelous, things that, that people would wonder, where did this man learn such things? He's never gone to seminary. Where did he get all of this information? The rabbis would come and debate with Christ, and Jesus would shut them down. He called them hypocrites, whitewash tombs. You don't know. Go and learn what Moses meant when he said this. That was Jesus. He walked with this man, and yet he had not seen him in glory. And the first time he sees him in glory, he hears this voice of many waters, the sound of a trumpet, and write these things down, and he sees Jesus. And when he sees the glorified Christ, that's it for him. That ought to be it for us too, don't you think? Get a glimpse of Jesus. Because when you get a glimpse of Jesus, humility becomes part of your life, and certainty becomes part of your being. Because Jesus Christ was once dead, but he's alive and he lives forevermore. And Jesus Christ, the one who raised Christ from the dead, also has raised us in Christ. We have the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. So we have no reason to fear. We have no reason to fear. Why? What's the worst thing that can happen to me? I go to heaven. Is that bad? Is that bad? I go to heaven. Oh, that's you Christians. You think that you're going to die and become food for worms. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. But until that moment, I'm still blessed. And I still have joy. And if you, if you think I'm a fool, that's fine. Join me. Be a fool for Christ too. Because you know what? In Christ, I have hope. And without Christ, there is no hope. I have hope in Christ. He conquered the grave. He is the risen Lord. And he dwells in us, the church. And in him, we have victory. What else could you want? What else could you want? And so we'll be looking at this as we go through Revelation. Those are your introductions. We'll move into chapter two this next week.